Hey guys, welcome back to another video. This video is gonna be my take on a masterclass on Laravel optimization that I wish I had when I started development. Uh, There's gonna be some generic web development advice here, but also a lot of Laravel specific. I have my notes on the side here. I've, I've been preparing for this one, but I have no code ready. So we're gonna code live and I'm gonna show you the, the usual pitfalls in, in optimization and what you can do to fix them. Um, before I, I jump in, I just wanna say that this video is sponsored by Cloudways. Uh, Cloudways is your one-stop shop for WordPress and Laravel hosting. I've been with them for years, uh, host all my websites with them, host all my client websites with them, and they, they have never let me down. So if you're looking for a managed VPS host for your PHP project, I highly recommend Cloudways. Uh, there is a link in the description below, and if you use my code DAVIDG, you get $10 off. Um, so in this video, we're going to start with just a, a demo application. I've named it Optimization Demo.Test. And I have a couple points here that I'm going to go through in the code with you to show what I would do as now a senior, whatever that means these days, uh, um, and, and things that I learned when I first started working with other very skilled uh, Laravel developers at my first job. And now we're six or seven years later, I don't even, don't even know how long it's been, but, uh, I've been, I've been building Laravel apps for a long time. So, um, the first thing I should mention if you, if you're new to development is, kind of uh, your, your, your build tools and what that means for your JavaScript and CSS. From a bird's eye view, uh, your, your project kind of uh, front end JavaScript and CSS config is going to be uh, in the package.json. You have your dependencies here. I have very few because it's a fresh project. Uh, but the main difference here is that when you're building locally, what you're gonna do is you're gonna do npm i for install and then npm run dev. Uh, in this case, the, the the tool that Laravel now by default uses to build your app uh, app's front end is Vite. Uh, it's a very fast bundler. But uh, when you use it locally, you run npm run dev. And that kind of gives you this hot reload and uh, allows much faster development. Uh, it also gives you the feature that when you save your files and you go back to the browser, your page reloads. So it's really easy to develop. That used to not be a thing, believe it or not. Uh, but when you're, when you're deploying live, uh, to production, you're going to use npm run build, in this case, Vite build. Again, it depends on your bundler. We used to use Webpack. There used to be something called Laravel Mix. Uh, but these things change over the years and the, and the bundlers typically get faster. My point here is that if you are bundling for production, you're going to want to use the production one. Uh, because if you're bundling everything, you're going to be packing everything in your app to the front end and it's not going to be properly minified uh, and it's not going to be properly... Uh, it's not going to have all the stuff that you're not actually using in your app, even though it's in your 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 CSS, um, whether that be Tailwind or whatever. All of it's going to be sent to the front end for your production app. And if you if you're looking for optimization and speed, you definitely, definitely, definitely don't want to be sending everything. You want to send just the minimum possible uh, to your client. So this is just one tip. It's very simple. I'm not going to dive into it. Uh, but just be mindful of understanding and using this correctly. Uh, when you have your build script for your deploys, you want to use uh, the production one when you're in production. Uh, actually, I can even show you here. I'm, uh, I'm local and what I'm using is npm i and npm run dev. And this is giving me the hot reload stuff that I was talking about. Um, the next thing is eager loading. This is one that <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed to say because I I graduated from school, not from high school, but post-secondary, and that's what we call it in Canada. And I I took a, I took a ton of programming classes, and nobody ever discussed in web development the classes eager loading. We did algorithms and all kinds of theory and math and whatever, but nobody discussed eager loading, and it's just mind-boggling because it's a common thread in a lot of frameworks, and it's like the number one thing that a lot of new Laravel developers mess up. What eager loading is, is it basically, there's a lot of instances when you're building a Laravel app where you, you've got a model and you're, you're displaying or using data from a related model over and over in a loop. Uh, in this case, what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna use the example of, let's say we're building an application for a mechanic, like a garage. And a mechanic's garage has customers. In this case, we're just gonna reuse the user model. Just, let's just say. And users have vehicles. Well, sometimes you have a guy that has three vehicles that, that gets work done, oil changes, whatever it might be. And so um, we're going to go through this example. But when you're, when you're wanting to list all customers and their cars, 
You don't want to be going querying every time to get the car details. You don't want to be uh, uh, looping over a, uh, every single user and then and then displaying the car because what that does is that makes way too many calls to the database. And typically, the, the calls to the database in terms of time spent loading your page are the most expensive. Um, if you want a fast app, you want to be interacting with the database as little times as possible, getting the data in uh, in in as an efficient way as possible. And this is a whole, whole art. You could have an entire YouTube channel on literally just indexing columns, but um, eager loading. Let's, let's do this. So um, like I said, I'm going to reuse the user model. This comes default uh, in Laravel. I'm going to make this a little smaller. Hopefully you can see, uh, but this is, this is what it, it shows up as. I am going to generate a new model. So let's clear this up. By the way, I've installed uh, the Laravel debug bar. This is a fantastic plugin, uh, not plugin, sorry, extension. Is it a an extension? Whatever it is. Um, this is uh, the thing you need if you are want to be careful about optimizing your queries. And I'll show you why it's actually showing up here. It'll show you everything you need to know about your queries. And so let's get back to here. First thing we're going to do, we're going to generate a new model. So that's uh, PHP artisan make model. Uh, let's say vehicle and we're going to do a migration and a factory that's what dash mf means and now we're going to have a vehicle model uh, in this vehicle model we're going to set protected guided to an empty array guarded sorry what am i saying guarded we're, we're <laughs> i'm creating a guide right now uh guarded and then we're going to make a relationship to, oops, oh, looks like my, uh, no, that typically works. Okay. Public function user. And this is a relationship. And we're going to call this, uh, we're just going to return users. See, my formatter is not even working. That's weird. Let's do return this belongs to user. And I'm not, I'm not going to explain every little bit of this because I have a ton of videos on creating CRUD applications and stuff. So uh, this is belongs to because the user ID is on the vehicle table, uh, vehicles table rather. Uh, and on the user model, we're going to create the same thing. So public function vehicles, plural. And we're going to return this has many vehicle. Nice and simple. Don't need imports because they're in the same directory here. So uh, now we're going to go over to a factory. Um, sorry, I have to do the migration first. So that should be called create vehicle. Create vehicles table. And we're just going to give this a foreign ID, user ID. It can't be nullable. And we're also going to give this uh, a name. So table string name. And that cannot be nullable either. Your vehicle needs a name. Uh, so now we have users who own vehicles, multiple vehicles. And we're going to go into our database. First of all, let's run it. Let's migrate it. Uh, PHP artisan migrate. Let's go into our database here. And now we have vehicles, perfect. And let's go into our factory. So we already have a user factory that comes default with Laravel, but what we want to create now is this. So this, sorry, wow. User ID goes to user. We want to import the actual model, not the factory. That's one, and then name. And we're just going to hope, it's going to be weird, but if I just use faker name, Maybe we'll get something good. I'm not sure if, uh, I think that's it, yeah. So Faker's included in your factories, by the way. You can use it to do addresses, cities, postal codes, zip codes, whatever you want. It usually usually has it. So you just need to know how to, how to get to it. Uh, database seeder. So uh, in our database right now, in our database seeder rather, I'm gonna enlarge this just for the sake of the video. 
and maybe make this a little smaller, it's easier to see. So we're creating one user. It's not gonna work for us, let's just delete this. We're not gonna be logging in anyway, so it doesn't matter. We wanna create 10 users. No, we wanna create 50 users. And we want to also generate vehicles as vehicle factory count. Let's do three vehicles each. Let's just do that. Uh, actually, in theory, this should work. Let's see if it works. So I've already migrated. I think it's PHP artisan DB seed. Okay, it didn't fail. That's good news. Let's see. Wow, okay, we got vehicles. Great, they're named like people. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> that's It just is what it is, it's fine. Um, and we have all the users. So I think I think I put 50, yeah, there's 50 users times three, there should be 150 vehicles, which there is. So this worked. And now we have the fun part. So I get to show you why eager loading is so bad. Um, let's clean this up and go to web. And perfect, I get this here. Let's DD, make sure that I can prove to you that I'm on the right page. There you go, I'm DDing one. And we're gonna just, we're just gonna output uh, users in their vehicles, right? So if I return, let's, let's get rid of this. If I return user, I wanna import that uh, all. Let's see what happens. Okay. So we get all our users. Oh, it's too bad the debug bar doesn't show up. How am I gonna show that? You know what, I'm gonna to have to just make a, a blade file for this. So let's go back. Let's see where the welcome page is coming from. Let's uh, copy it. So if I click this, perfect. Duplicate. Oh, I can't even duplicate here. I'm missing some of my tools, that's weird. Um, yeah, copy, paste. And let's call this uh, vehicles.blade.php. Gonna get rid of all of this, we don't need it. What loads right now if I show this? Vehicles. Nothing, great. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's not do this. Perfect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass the vehicles to here. I'm gonna do vehicles, sorry, users. User all. And I'm gonna make sure this is imported. App models user. Okay, and nothing happens, but you can see that we're querying select star from user, users rather. Uh, and inside here, we're going to do for each uh, users as user. And we're gonna do this within an unordered list. It's not gonna be pretty, but it'll work. We're gonna do li, li, user name. Boom, okay. Uh, gonna be prettier, I think, if we do an ordered list. So let's just do that and see what comes up. Save. Oh, that is weird. Why is that not working? I guess not. Let's do unordered list. Okay, so we have a, a list of users and we're showing their names. This has nothing to do with optimization yet. This is just me figuring it out. Um, what we're gonna do now is within this list item, uh, show all the users' vehicles. And uh, vehicles, users, user, vehicles. And we're gonna see 
what comes up, it might break. Okay, it's giving us the exact JSON. See, it's, it's querying out the vehicles. So what if we do map name? Okay, so um, I wish this was clearer. Let's get a break in here. Let's break this up. Let's add a break here. That's not gonna, okay, great. Anyway, so we have uh, the name, which maybe we can bold the old school way using the B tag. Would not recommend doing that, but for the sake of this demo, let's do that. That should work, perfect. Okay, so we've got users and their vehicles, right? Uh, and you can see here in the debug bar, which is why it's so valuable, we get star from users, and then we get star from vehicles where vehicles user ID is one, and then it gets it. And that's querying all the vehicles for this user. Then we have vehicles where vehicles dot user ID is two. This is user two, and that's another query, another round trip to the database, uh, request read back uh, for the vehicles. And as you can see, this will go, this will go 50 times. And this, this issue is actually called N plus one query issue. It's an, it, it is a, it really is a bug. It shouldn't be allowed. And there's a lot of ways you can, you can actually disable it uh, locally on your computer so you don't make this mistake and it, you can avoid it. It, it. The application will break. There's a way to actually break it on your local development if you do this by accident. But uh, the best way is to just, when you're, when you're developing, be mindful of when you're querying outside tables and it, the requests keep coming. You're basically requesting data over and over and over. That's going to make tons of round trips for no reason. Uh, Laravel has a built-in method that deals with this, and I can actually reduce the queries here. We've got n plus one. It's called n plus one because we have 50 users. That's n plus one because we query all the users at once. That's one query. And then we get n 50 extra queries on top to get vehicles for each user. So uh, this is fixed with an eager load. If I were to go in here and just add with vehicles and get, all of a sudden we have the exact same results, okay? Except now we have two queries, which is what it should be. Select star from users and select star from vehicles where user ID is this. Laravel handles this for you. So now we have, um, reduced all these round trips that are unneeded and squeezed all the data that we need into one much bigger request to the database. But the database is very efficient. You'd much rather, I'd much rather request the database less, I'd much rather ask the database less times for stuff, but in bigger quantities than ask more often. Uh, and you could probably see that there's a bit of a reduction here. So 42 milliseconds with the eager load. And let me copy this this and let's see what it takes 69 milliseconds that's going to bounce around but overall the larger the data gets the worse it would be in fact let's prove that this is the case here database cedar let's make 500 users and have 30 cars each our db seed even the cedar is taking a little while longer to work now There we go. Now we should be able to go into our database here and see that there's, there's now 15,000 cars. So um, this page should take a lot longer to load. Uh, and even though we have 15,000 cars, it still takes 87 milliseconds, but that's with the eager load. And you can see what this one query is. It's gigantic, but this is much better than doing it individually. This is 87 milliseconds. And if I go here and enable the old one, where I'm, I'm doing the N plus one issue, uh, 323 milliseconds. This right here is the number one biggest issue in a lot of apps, especially built by someone who, people who are new to web development, number one. Um, and I think a layer on top of the N plus one issue is the lack of caching. Uh, a lot of times if, you, if you're building something like a dashboard, this is the sort of the next chapter in my in my spe little speech here. Uh, if you're building a dashboard with tons of data that's live, you cannot use caching. You can't cache the, the the response because it's live data. You want it to be accurate. However, if you're running a website that you know maybe uh, maybe you don't need real time data. Maybe maybe it's uh, 
maybe you're building a website for a, a, a dealership or uh, that that has co- that shows car inventory, and uh, you're okay with your customers getting fresh data every ten minutes. This would be a great opportunity to use caching, and I can actually show you with this. So, without the eager loading, right? It takes three hundred and fifty-five milliseconds. Uh, if we wrap this in a cache block, so cache. Remember uh, vehicles. That's the that's the name of your cache. Uh, TTL is uh, can be I think a number of seconds or let's do ten seconds or or a, a daytime object. Let's just do ten seconds for the sake of this video. So the next load is going to be the same speed, and of course we're still seeing speed here, but the load after that once the cache saves my, my, my data should be much faster. So let's reload from 97. What did I do here? Must be of type closure. Whoops. That's right. This is my mistake. Okay. So it's loaded. It's slower, 354 milliseconds, but it should be faster now. And it is, um, it's not much faster in this case, probably because my local is using is not, is not using Redis, uh, which will be discussed later in the talk. But if we go to my ENV here, yeah, my cache store is using the database. That's not the fastest one. You, if you truly want speed, you're gonna wanna use Redis or memcached. We'll, we'll discuss it later on in this video. But this is a, another layer on top of, some, uh, of what you might wanna do to optimize the data you're showing if you're okay with it not being current exactly all the time. Uh, and just it, it, what will happen after 10 seconds here is it'll run the first time, It'll save the data here to the vehicle's object in your cache store. Again, locally for me in this video, it's database. And after 10 seconds, the next the next person before 10 seconds, before the expiry, will see the cached object. After 10 seconds, if someone visits this page, it'll get the data fresh from the database again and recache it, save it. Uh, this is something we use a lot. And you just have to be careful where you use it because you sometimes you, you don't want stale data in certain places. So that's number two. So being that this video is sponsored by Cloudways, I kind of have to show you the the, the dashboard. Not just be, actually not just because it's sponsored, by the way, but because I've been using it for years. And this is actually my personal server that my blog is is running on. Um, and in production, you have Redis here. So Cloudways makes it really easy. You can run Redis with one click. I, it's actually set by default on. All you have to do is go into your uh, your Laravel ENV on your production site and on your server is uh, and, and enable it. Uh, there's no configuration and it is much, much faster than using any kind of other form. It's Redis, if you don't know, it's just a key value store. Uh, it's like an in-memory database and it's known for being ridiculously fast. Uh, there's a lot of examples of people storing huge amounts of data in Redis. And uh, as a way of, of reducing load on their database, in fact, I'm pretty sure back in the day, this is what Twitter was doing for people's feeds. Might even be doing that today. So uh, the other alternative to this is memcached. Cloudways is nice enough to also offer this and they give you a little bit of uh, information about this. Another caching layer dealing mainly with database queries. If restarted, all cache is lost and needs to be rebuilt. And that's because it's saved in the memory. These two things, uh, product, will do a great deal in in increasing the speed of your website if you are going to implement caching like we just saw here on this request, which is, sorry, which is right here. Okay, um, number three, this is big. And I, I'm not gonna write a, I'm not gonna write a, a code example about this because it would take a really long time. But one of the novice mistakes that I've seen many times is, a lot of times you'll, you'll even have coding tests for when you're applying for jobs ask you to uh, send a mailable, right? Laravel includes a mailable or a notification uh, helper. You can you can build them very easily, and uh, they allow you to easily queue them. For whatever reason, this is not often used, and this is a problem because if you, for example, have a user sign up and that user registers, and you need to send them an email welcoming them, but also having them uh, have them uh, verify their that they're willing to accept your emails or, you know, just verify the, their email if, you, if you're if you wanting to do that. Chances are that sending that mail will slow down the, the, the page refresh. You don't want to be sending mails or, or notifying, especially not if it's not just mail. In a notification, you can have 
database notifications. You can have SMS notifications. You can have mailables. You don't want to be doing this in line because it'll it'll block your requests from finishing. So one of the best ways you can improve the performance of your site is by queuing mailables. Um, you can also say the same thing for creating jobs for logging. If you have a complicated logging setup and your logger takes a while to log for whatever reason, uh, you're going to want to queue that. So you know, when an error happens and you catch it, queue the logging of that error. Um, and exports, this one's also very big. Uh, a lot of times when you're working in, in applications that act like dashboards for management or some sort of back office uh, usage, what you're, what you're going to have is a request to build Excel or CSV exports. And these exports typically, even with when using really well-built third-party packages, can take a really long time to generate. Sometimes it's because they're not, you know, people aren't using the, the eager loads correctly in the data that they're generating. But usually if, if you have a, a big admin application, you could have tens of thousands of records. And we've had that. So by default, now notifications seem to be using queuable. If you don't have queuing set up, it might still be slow. The way you have queuing set up is by using something like Redis. Redis client, um, sorry, queue. Queue connection, you're probably going to want to use Redis or um, Supervisor. And actually, back to Cloudways, uh, my apps use Supervisor to to run the queue worker and make sure things are alive. And actually, the, the, this is basically a, a glorified cron, uh, and it makes it really nice and easy to make sure your jobs are, are sent out on time. Number four, uh, requests caching. Your application is is in layers, and we've kind of started bottom up. Uh, we started talking about front end builds. We started talking about n plus one issues and how to fix that with eager loads. Uh, we've talked about caching data, Redis, this kind of stuff. But we're slowly making our way out of the application and and what you've actually built into it, and into the part where the the, the layer where the the request is actually coming into your app. Okay. And one of the things that I personally like to do is I like to route my DNS through Cloudflare. So when I buy a domain, I set the name servers to Cloudflare's. And then I go into my Cloudflare dashboard and I add the new domain. And then I set my DNS records inside Cloudflare. I use the free plan. I think it's great. I don't need anything more. And I, I like Cloudflare because it, it includes a lot of stuff for free. But if you're running a production application, you might want to upgrade. Uh, Cloudways allows you to actually just purchase for one or one to four domains here. You can you can even integrate Cloudflare right in the dashboard. Uh, I personally just go to cloudflare.com and add my domains there. And uh, one of the other important things is called Varnish. Uh, and I will read this to you because it's going to be it's going to make much more sense. One of the several layers of caching for your application, you can disable it uh, when developing or on test staging servers. Do not disable on production servers. If restarted, all the cache is lost and needs to be rebuilt. What this does is it caches your pages and your resources in, in memory. And so um, it's, it just makes your website a lot faster by serving from memory instead of hitting the back end of your site and having it all generated uh, on, on all requests. So some users might, might just be getting an, an older page, but... It is much faster. So that's another layer on top. And then we can also talk about uh, vertical and horizontal uh, scaling. So vertical scaling is very simple. Uh, this little VPS I'm using is just for my blog. It's it's the one gigabyte. It's the cheapest one. Um, and I've, I've been using it that way since 2016, but it works. And vertical scaling just means that, you know, if, if you need more power, you upgrade, right? So you might go to a two gigabyte or an eight gigabyte VPS this is the simplest way to scale up your performance if you want to make things faster. If you've gone through your N plus one, if you've made sure that your front end is uh, um, optimized, you, if you've uh, made sure that your queue, your queues, you're queuing all the stuff that can be queued. Uh, you have Redis, you're caching as much as you can on the front end layer using stuff like Varnish and you're caching your actual queries that can be cached. This is vertical scaling. But there comes a point, and, and this is very common even at, at work, we, we serve thousands and thousands and thousands of students. This would not be enough, right? So the other option is, um, there's two more options actually. We don't use this one either, but this is horizontal scaling. We horizontal scale, but in a much more custom way. 
Cloudways offers horizontal scaling in that uh, in a way where you pay thirty five dollars a month for a plan. By you know, for example, in plan one, you host your website and it's managed. So when Cloudways detects that your website is being hit with a lot more traffic than usual, this is just fun fact. This is built on Kubernetes. It will take your Kubernetes uh, container and it will put it onto more scaled, identical copies of, of your infrastructure. So if 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 one container can handle 50,000 users at once and it detects 60,000, it'll start another container. If that goes up to 140,000, it'll do a third, it'll create a third container and it'll be identical to your current application. This is, this is the automated horizontal scaling. Um, this is hands-off managed, it's cool. Um, I personally don't use it. What I've used a lot in my in my professional life is um, stuff like Forge, Laravel Forge. So Forge is a product of Laravel, and uh, it allows uh, management of multiple servers and from all hosting providers. And why this is important is it allows you to create it allows you to create servers using stuff like uh, Amazon uh, AWS EC2 instances. And it can spin up a load balancer, and then it could help you connect that load balancer to two, let's say, uh, pods, containers, whatever, to actual web servers. And it'll also allow you to spin up a separate server for a database. And it can also spin up a separate server for a queue worker, which is something that's important. And this is what we use for for big production sites because sometimes you you have traffic that's very easy to serve on a web server kind of level, but your database needs to be huge. Um, and sometimes you need a small database, but your web server needs to be bigger. And then you need a huge worker because you're processing data in the background. Maybe you have an ingest server. You have a ton of data coming in. Uh, so this is the most custom. And um, this is what this is what if you if you really have a ton of traffic, this is where you'd be going. It's just good to know like the ins and outs of this kind of stuff, uh, especially if you're just starting as a developer, because you want to at least know how to talk about it when someone asks you, right? Um, and the last one I want to talk about is really nitty gritty. This is something that if you're new to development, you might want to know just to just to talk about in conversation. Maybe you get asked something in, in an interview or whatever, and you want to bring up something like Laravel Octane. So the way Laravel works is as a framework is you have an entry point into the framework. When a request comes in, uh, what will happen is uh, it, I think it enters index.php. Okay. And then it goes through here and it goes through the whole vendor auto load sets up your app and uh, loads whatever you have in the app service provider. This is a brand new app, so it doesn't have anything, but you'll be booting a lot of stuff, registering your custom service providers, whatever might be going on in here. But the point is that this happens on every single request and this takes time. And what uh, Laravel Octane is, is it basically is an adapter to allow you to use these like new age, new style uh, PHP servers. Uh, Franken PHP is one, the modern PHP app server written in Go. Uh, Roadrunners, Road, Roadrunner and Swool are other options. So Swool is here, Roadrunner, uh, modernized PHP applications with Golang. Roadrunner is a high performance PHP application server, a load balancer and process manager written in Golang. What these do is allow, um, go around this whole dependency building thing by caching your, uh, your container. The problem with this is that you, when, you, when you're caching your container and then the user is kind of skipping the whole building of your app on each request, you might have memory problems. You might have a memory leak or maybe yeah, maybe there's something, something in your app service provider that loads certain dependencies based on who the user is or what the user is doing. Whatever it might be, that's going to be cached now until the cache breaks. Uh, and it, it's reloaded. I know this might sound like gibberish, but it's good to know. Uh, the basics of this is that it skips that container, the, the whole app service provider build thing. Uh, and it also gives you concurrency. So you could you could run multiple tasks at once. And there's an example here. So you can you can get user all and server all the two queries at one time. Uh, it doesn't, they don't block each other. They're just, they get them simultaneously because of the way that uh, a multi-threaded uh, PHP server works. And that's pretty much it. I hope this was somewhat useful. Um, and I mean, this is just the guide I wish I had when I was starting. I was kind of thinking what else I missed here. But honestly, if, if anything past this, if you wanted to learn more, I would just go to something like laracast.com. 
and they have a whole bunch of series on on optimizing specifically on each of these points I touched on. And that's how I would learn. Um, and of course, uh, I have to mention again, this video is sponsored by Cloudways. So if you're looking for a VPS, there's a link in the description below. It helps the channel. Uh, and if you use the, uh, the code DAVIDG, you also get $10 off. Um, if you have any video requests, please leave a comment below. I'd love to hear them. And I guess I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.